So, uh, ungodly with our money, and if we would just give, He will bless, and He'll provide your needs. Um, and I know that you could say, well, that was just your situation, Michael, but I believe it really, it, that's how it works. I'm not saying God's always going to give, because sometimes God only gives what we need, not always what we want. And I'm not saying you're going to have a glorious life if you give. I'm just saying that when you do give, God honors that. When you give with a cheerful heart, He will honor that. So when you give to speed the light, He will honor that. When we did one in 1,000 last year, there was a girl, um, well, an adult now, but, but there was a lady that gave, um, I think, $500 to different people for that signed, signed in to put $500 towards different people doing one in 1,000 for speed the light. And that one particular Sunday that we did that, about $500 to $600. And that day, she got all that money. It was like people were coming to her and handing her money saying, you know, hey, this happened like six months ago. Here's some money. And given that money, so everything that she, she said she was going to give was given to her. So she didn't even have to try and make it up or bring it out of her own pocket. It was all right there. And so she also had that remainder of money when it was all over and she had paid for it. And so I really believe God works in that way. And if we would have faith enough to work in that way, He would. And I said it last week. I said that really when you think about faith, it's like a bunch of people go and they decide to pray for rain because there's been a drought in the land for a long time. And which one of them had faith? Well, it was the one that brought an umbrella because he believed it's going to rain, so I better be prepared for rain. We have to act like God's going to move if He's going to move. We have to expect Him to move if He's going to move. And I believe the same thing applies with our money. And just like I said earlier tonight, if we will participate, what would happen if someone walked in here that you invited to church or that you led to the Lord and they walked in here and they recognized everybody was participating in the listening uh, to the Word, in the prayer, in the, in the worship. If everybody was participating or even the majority, what atmosphere they walk into. And, and see, we, we can't get into this idea that church is not about participation. We all have to participate. But what if somebody came in here and nobody was doing anything and they thought their whole point of coming to church was just to sit and do nothing? But when they see that you participate, they'll recognize I am to do something when I'm here. Something's expected of me. And yes, something is expected of everybody when they come to church. So anyway, my sermon tonight is called The Diet Gospel. Um, not a sermon title I ever thought I'd use, but The Diet Gospel. Um, I actually heard it used. I saw a video on Twitter that was very ungodly. It didn't look ungodly. It was a guy preaching, and everything he said was just totally wrong. And somebody tweeted under it and said the diet gospel and I thought man that's kind of funny because he was referring to false teaching but anyway so the diet gospel uh, you know in today's world everybody knows what diet drinks are basically they're a drink that has different ingredients some of the ingredients from a regular like a regular coke some of those ingredients are missing in the diet coke while other ingredients are added in so it's something very different that's supposedly supposed to be healthier whether it is or not people will probably be debating that for the years some people like those drinks who in here likes diet drinks more than regular drinks good Good. We're in good company. Uh, but here's the thing. Although some people prefer diet drinks, some people also prefer the diet gospel. The gospel that is missing key components and the gospel that is uh, not the gospel that we know, the gospel that has things added in and the gospel that has things taken out that were not in the original gospel. Some people go on a gospel diet too. You know what a diet is, right? It's when you don't eat certain things. So some people go on a gospel diet and they don't breathe in the Word of God. So whether you believe the diet gospel or whether you go on a gospel diet, you are in dangerous waters. Let me tell you why. Romans 10.1 Paul is talking to uh, the Romans and he says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God about Israel is for them that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. What is, okay, there's a few words in there that I want to I hit on. So he says they, did, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So the word zeal in that passage, I looked it up in the dictionary, uh, the, the uh, Vines Expository Dictionary, which basically takes it back to the root of that Greek word. And zeal basically means a fervent mind for God. It means you are on fire for God. He's saying these people have, I mean, they are passionate about God. So if you don't know, what, that's what zeal means. Is you're passionate about something. You want to have a zeal for basketball or softball or for painting or for singing. Whatever it is, you have a zeal for that thing and it's the thing that drives you. Some people have a, a zeal simply to watch sports or, to have, or they have a zeal for a certain team. So the word zeal means a fervent mind for it. And in this case, these people have a fervent mind for God. 
And the word knowledge in this passage means exact or full knowledge, sometimes discernment or recognition. So Paul is basically calling the Israelites. He's saying they have a they are on fire for they have a passion for God, but they lack discernment and they lack recognition of God's right character and they lack understanding of who God really is. And so they come up with their own idea of what God is and who God is. These people love God, but they don't know anything about this God that they love, and so they come up with their own idea of who He is and what He's like. An idea of, God, of who God is and what He requires, but it's based on misunderstanding. I say, in this room, many of us here are zealous for God. We love going to church camp. We love going to youth convention. Whenever we love coming to church, we love worshiping and all this kind of stuff. We go to Christian concerts. We just love the atmosphere when we're at church. Maybe we even like to hear some good preaching, but we don't know God as we should. We're all about Jesus, but we lack knowledge of God, His purposes, His ways, and we will pay the price for it if that's how we continue. Proverbs 19.2 says, Desire without knowledge is not good. And whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. In the end, that's in the ESV. In the NLT it says, zeal without knowledge is not good. It says, desire without knowledge is not good. So let me just give you an example. Okay, so have any of you ever wanted to be with somebody in a dating relationship, but you didn't know much about them? You just, I mean, you just knew. Listen, I used to always tell people, when you go to church camp, don't try and get a boyfriend or girlfriend, because you don't know a thing about them, and they could be anybody they want to be that week. I, okay, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I just tell you, I tell people that I say, I say, don't do that because you don't know a thing about that person. They could be anybody they want to be that week for you. And, you know, whatever. You were just smitten with this person. You wanted them, but you didn't know much about their family, their attitudes, their lifestyle choices, their beliefs, anything. You probably paid the price for that at the end of the relationship or maybe even during the relationship. All of us have, if you've ever dated somebody and you've been, you've, in that relationship has ended, you've pro it's probably be be been because at some point you lack knowledge of who they really were, right? And at the end of the relationship came because they did something or you did something that they didn't know that you about you or however it was. It, it's lack of knowledge. And so some of us come and we're like, boy, she is one good-looking girl or he's one good-looking guy, but that's all we know about them. We don't know who they are, and because of that, we pay the price. Right? <laughs> That's just an, an example that works for teenagers. Is that sometimes we desire something, but we know nothing about it. Some people desire drugs, but they know nothing of what it will do to your mind. And that's why they pay the price for it. God's not a bad thing like drugs, but sometimes people desire God, but they don't know anything about Him, and so they'll soon fail in Him. You remember last week I talked about how Sometimes we haven't counted the cost. Like, we have to count the cost before we follow Jesus. Some of us have just decided, oh, I want to follow Jesus, not realizing what it required of us, and how that was going to cause us to fail and to f fall in our Christian walk. It's the same concept here. So many of us, man, we love the idea of God. We love what we hear about God. But, man, we don't know much about Him ourselves, and because of that, we're going to fail. The Pharisees are the perfect example of that. The Pharisees were those guys that contested Jesus all the time, they, they, constant, they, had, they were all for God, right? They were all for the God of the Old Testament, which is the God of the New, but they did not recognize that Jesus was God. They missed out on that part. They were so passionate for God and their traditions in God and everything that had come before that they missed out on the reality of who God was. They didn't have the knowledge they needed. And really, their zeal without knowledge resulted in self-righteousness. Remember, they thought they were just this great thing. They thought, you can't tell us we're wrong, Jesus. We're right. Self-righteousness is one of the most dangerous things to be in. Uh, maybe more so than drugs, maybe more so than even prostitution. And you know why that? Because Jesus said prostitutes and tax collectors come into the kingdom of God before you. And he was talking to the Pharisees and he was basically saying, you know why prostitutes come to get saved before the Pharisees do? Because the prostitutes can recognize there's something wrong with me. I need help. I'm not right. Pharisees are too stubborn in their beliefs and too stubborn in what they think they are to say, yeah, sure, you're right, Jesus. Pride, self-righteousness, thinking there could, we cannot ever get to a point where we think there could, not, there could be nothing wrong in our heart. We always have to continue to test ourselves. Get those views on that lob. 
<laughs> the Pharisees were still bound to the Old Testament law and they failed to recognize Jesus as Lord. Zeal alone will not lead you to salvation. You know, that like just being on fire and thinking, man, God's great. I love the feeling I get when I come to church. Worship is great. I love the feeling I had at church camp. All this kind of stuff. It will not lead you to salvation and it definitely won't lead you to God. Here's a great example. All of us went to church. Like, if you've ever been to church camp, youth convention, any of that kind of stuff, and you just gotten on fire, chrysalis or anything like that, you just gotten on fire for God, man. God, Jesus, everything. School rolls around. Nope, it's, it's gone, right? <laughs> Very, very true. And any of you that have been to camp know that. Even if it wasn't you, it was somebody else. And it's been me before. And you know why that is? Because it was all zeal and it was no knowledge. We just liked the feeling we had when we were around God. Man, I just, ooh, I just feel good when I, when I talk about Jesus. And I just feel good when I hear about God or when I get to sing. But we didn't know what it really required of us. We lacked knowledge. Here's some examples in the Bible of people that had zeal without knowledge. Paul himself said, before I was a Christian, in Galatians 1.15, he says, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Here Paul was, he was zealous for God. Do you know what? Paul believed in God. But who was he killing? He was killing Christians. How's that work? Well, because Paul had a misunderstanding of who God was. He was zealous. He was excited for the things that, that God had shown them in the past, but he had no knowledge of God's mystery and God's will in today's world. And so he didn't know Jesus was the Christ. And because of that, Paul was zealous, but he had no knowledge, and he was killing Christians. Another example was Peter. Peter was, all, Peter was a very passionate guy. Right? He just, I mean, he was passionate. He, was, he could get angry really easy. He could get upset really easy. And if you remember that story, when they came to get Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane the night before he died, the, the, the soldiers come and this big crowd comes to take him. And Peter says, nope. And he pulls out a, a sword and he cuts off Malchus's ear. And then remember, Jesus heals the ear. He puts the ear back on the guy and the guy's healed. Well, guess what? We all would think, well, he's got good intentions. He's just trying to protect Jesus, right? He's just trying to protect God. He's just trying to protect his friend here. He had this zeal for Jesus, but it, he lacked knowledge. And because of that, he did something he shouldn't have done. He lacked knowledge that this was what God was going to do, that Jesus had to die. And so he cut off Malchus' ear. And Jesus was like, whoa, wait a second. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Put the guy's ear back on. I was like, Peter, slow down, buddy. This dude had a zeal without knowledge. That's what zeal without knowledge causes you to do. Maybe not cut people's ears off, but it causes you to do things that Jesus wouldn't want you to do. Another example is Simon the Magician. Uh, probably earlier this year or last year, late last year, I did a sermon on Simon the Magician. and this dude, th There were people coming and healing and praying in tongues. Peter and, and John were doing that to people. And Simon the Magician came and he got saved. And then he saw what they were doing. He saw they were healing people. He saw miracles were happening. And he said, I'll pay you for this. Like, if you'll give me this power, I'll pay you for it. Boy, he had a zeal to see the things that God happened, right? Can we deny that? He wanted to see what God was going to do. But he, he lacked knowledge. He lacked knowledge that that wasn't how it worked, that you couldn't pay for it. As a matter of fact, it was so bad that he lacked knowledge that Peter said, you know, you better repent before you burn in hell. All because a guy thought that he could. Knowledge is very important. Simon was saved, it tells us, but he lacked knowledge about how God worked. And because of that, he could have burned in him. But, you know, there's three really bad examples, like some examples of like people that had zeal without knowledge. Here's an example of some, of some guys that had zeal with knowledge. This is the way to do it, okay? Joshua and Caleb. Have you ever heard of Joshua and Caleb in the Bible? Joshua was the guy that walked around Jericho, and, or led the people around Jericho, and the walls fell. But this is before that, okay? When Moses was still leader in Israel, they sent 12 spies out, okay? Remember, they wandered the wilderness for 40 years, just wandering in circles, basically, because God had promised them some land and told them that... But, but they were too stubborn. And Joshua and Caleb were two of the twelve spies. They sent one from every tribe of Israel. These twelve spies went in, and they looked at the land, which, remember, was called the Promised Land. They looked at the land, and when the spies came back, ten of them said, We have no chance. We will never make it. These guys are giants. Their food is bigger than us. We will never take them on. We will never beat them. And so Israel said, Okay. We aren't gonna we aren't gonna go in and try and beat them. But Joshua and Caleb were two guys that they were saying, no, let's take them. Let's go after them. So what if they're bigger than us? God has made a promise. God has told us this is our land. And God will be with us. 
They were the only ones excited about going in attacking this land. They were the only ones. But you know what it was? They had knowledge that this was God's promise. They weren't just zealous, like, let's go take the land. Like, let's just take... No, they knew that God had said, this is your land. And if it's your land, I'm going to help you take it, right? I've already given ownership to you, Israel. And Joshua and Caleb had this zeal. They were ready. They were passionate to go in and take, wipe these people out. But their zeal was based on what they knew God had already said. You know, a few weeks ago I talked about the voice of God and how important it is to hear the voice of God before we choose to do something for God. And the same concept is here. Sometimes we get so excited to do something for God, but we forget to listen for what He wants us to do for Him. And so we mess up. And we cause problems. Joshua and Caleb weren't that way. They knew what God had said. They knew God had said, this is the promise. They wanted something crazy, but their zeal was based on the knowledge of what God had said. Knowledge always has to come before zeal. Because knowledge has to come before zeal. We should not, we should not get passionate about something until we know about that something. We should never get passionate about, about God until we know that God. And really, knowing God is going to bring that passion, right? But it's such dangerous waters to get into a place where we are so excited for God, but we know nothing of Him. You have to know God's Word. We have to hear God's voice. We have to be led to God's Spirit. And we have to know God's promises. Because here's why. If, if we're zealous for God, God will lead us, it, it will lead us to believe any teaching on God that pleases our ears. You'll believe anything if you're passionate about God, but you don't know anything about Him. You hear something about God that sounds just like the Gospel? And you're, Man, that sounds great. You're, you're super important. You know, you're, you're somebody important because you're having problems in your life. So you're somebody special to God. You know, you must be a real big deal in the kingdom of heaven because you're having problems and these storms are coming. Sounds just, sounds enough like the gospel. It sounds enough like the word of God that we just might believe it and fall into that trap. 2 Timothy 4 3 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into this. There is a time, and it's already here, there's already people doing it, and maybe some of you are doing it, where, where you just listen and you just hear what you want to hear, because maybe you like the idea of God, you're zealous for God, you're passionate about God, but you don't know anything of Him and of His ways, and so you'll believe anything anybody says about Him, because some of their arguments are pretty convincing. There's some pretty convincing arguments out there that gay marriage is okay. There's some pretty convincing arguments out there that drinking is not a problem. There's some pretty convincing arguments out there about a lot of things in the Christian world that are not true. How easy would it be to fall into that trap if we don't have an understanding of who God is and what He requires of us? 15. Paul called it making a shipwreck of your faith. 1 Timothy 1.19 he tells Timothy, hold it, he said, hold faith and good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I handed over to Satan that they may not learn to blaspheme. I say it again, how easy is it to believe something that sounds just enough like the gospel? Because there's so much stuff out there. There are people out there, and I, I've fallen into that trap before, and I try and do my best, that we'll read any book about the Bible, we'll read any book about God, but we won't read the Bible. And that's obviously the enemy working against us. Trust me on that. The enemy wants to work against you in that way so that you won't open your Bible because that's where the truth is. Sure, there are some people that preach and they preach what God wants them to preach. There are some books that are written that are inspired and, and, and illuminated by God. But there's also a lot of books and a lot of people speaking that aren't. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. He's saying you can pretty much tell if somebody's a false teacher based on the way they act. Like you'll know because they won't be living it. But so many of us don't see behind the curtain of somebody that we listen to on YouTube or all those different things. And so we fall into false teaching really easily. And here's the other thing. It's my responsibility as your youth pastor to teach you correctly and to make sure you don't get into this false stuff. Ephesians 4.11, it says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors, teachers, to equip the saints, etc., 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 until we all attain the unity of the faith to mature manhood, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, 
by human cunning, by craftiness, and in deceitful schemes. He's basically saying, we must reach a point as Christians where we don't just fall into any belief that we want to because it sounds enough like God that we like it and we'll accept it. We cannot be tossed to and fro in such a way that we're zealous for God but don't know anything about it. That is one of the most dangerous places to be in a walk with God. And don't forget, the people that fell into that trap were the ones that killed Jesus. They were passionate about God. They loved the things of God, but they had no knowledge of Him and of His ways. And because of that, guess what? They killed God Himself. See, it's real easy. It is real easy to just lay back and rely on any Facebook post we see, sprinkle of Jesus, etc., to teach you theology. Because it's a lot easier than picking up your Bible. Listen, let me say, I'll say this. Because um, I believe it's important as your youth pastor to speak out to sprinkle of Jesus. I've seen where people put the screenshots, and sometimes it's some real good stuff. And other times I think that's just that sounds just enough. That's got just enough good in it that it sounds right and it's not scripture. There's so many people that are content to believe in God's love. Like so many people come, like, okay, here's an, here's a perfect example of some people that may be zealous for God's stuff. But, or, or for some version of God they've created, but they have no knowledge of them. All these people that start these churches and say, like they make it a point to flaunt their homosexuality and say, man, you know what, God, God loves you. So says 1 John. Well, they sure do lack knowledge about all the times that the Bible says those who engage in gay sex are going to go to hell. Those are the kind of people that will live in eternal darkness, right? That's just an example of people, because some of these people, like, they will put out there, oh, Jesus, God, all this stuff. I love God. I love Jesus. But I also, you know, God loves you. You're special. You're something great. So just keep doing what you're doing, because God loves you anyway. That turns into the belief of universalism, which says everybody will get saved. And my Bible doesn't teach that. But some people have gotten into that belief. And look, God does love you. God wishes that none should perish. But people forget God's also righteous and holy and He cannot be near anything that isn't. And God judges. And God does send to hell for our sins. That's just some examples of that. But you have to understand that, like I said, it's so easy to rely on just what we see in here and not ever have to pick up our Bible to know who God is Himself. To pray so that we can know God. So much easier just to scroll through Facebook and say, man, that's just... Yeah, Jesus. Awesome. I love that post. I'm going to share it. But you don't even get what it means. Seriously. I challenge, I challenge everybody in this room to go back and look at some of the... If you've ever shared a, a meme or any of that kind of stuff that was Christian or retweeted something or if you have social media or whatever, uh, go back and I challenge you to really find out what that really said. Because, man, some of it may be true, but some of it also might be just true enough that it sounds like the gospel and we're going to believe it. I mean, there is such a fine line in Christianity and so many of us have just taken one step to the right and it's taken us down a rabbit trail so in our faith. Mm -hmm. right right. yeah. here's, here's some quotes about this. Vance Havner, who I have no idea who he is, but I found this quote on my phone yesterday, and I think, or today actually, and I think it's very important. Hear this. Satan is not fighting churches. He's joining them. He does more harm by sowing tares than by pulling up wheat. He accomplishes more by imitation than by outright opposition. Satan's not fighting churches. He is joining them. That's why we should be so careful of what we believe. You know, you can't blame anybody for your lack of knowledge but yourself. I'm really bad about that. Well, you didn't tell me that. I guess in some of the situations, but when it comes to God, you can't blame anybody but yourself for not knowing who He is. If you'll seek me, you will find me. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. It starts with you. We have got to start learning who God is, and you can't just rely on me to tell you that. The Bereans were, are, are 
Paul called some people in the Bible noble because when Paul preached, they went and made sure that that's what the Bible actually said. And that's what you should do. You shouldn't just take my word for it that what I say is the gospel truth. Because it just might not. And I challenge and dare say that many of you in this room have come every week and listened to me preach and haven't opened your Bible once. And so you really don't know. I could be feeding you lies every single week. Am I right? Because, man, I'll tell you. I can make a pretty convincing argument. I'm sure. I'm sure. I could twist some stuff in Scripture and make a pretty convincing argument for something that's not true, and you wouldn't even know. Because it happens. It happens. It, 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 it's just, it's so, it looks just so much like the gospel. It sounds just like something God would say that we accept it as truth. Charles Spurgeon said, the best interpreter of a book is generally the man who wrote it. The Holy Ghost wrote the scriptures. Go to Him and get their meaning and you will not be misled. What's he mean by that? We have to put prayer when we study God's Word. See, I'm not even saying study God's Word tonight. I mean, I am, but that's not even the point of my sermon. My point is that you have to be cautious of what you believe. And it, when we do study God's Word, we have to go to Him for our understanding. I even saw a tweet today by somebody I followed that said, you know, and this is really goes for pastors, but if you open up a book of the Bible and read a passage and then go and look in like a commentary or a devotion to find out what it means, you give the Holy Spirit no chance, really, to show you what it means. You just allowed somebody else to show you. And how dangerous is that? I'm not saying don't listen to anybody. I'm not saying don't trust anybody. But we have to be cautious because anybody can say anything and convince you that they're right. There are some who wish to magnify the Spirit but neglect the Word. This will not do. Fanaticism and baseless enthusiasm are the result. R.A. Torrey said that. He basically was saying, there's a lot of us, like we love what the Holy Spirit, oh man, we just love going to worship, and we just love camp, and just, ooh, the hype, the excitement, but we forget God's Word, and all that turns into is we're just fanatic, and we're just enthusiastic, but it's baseless, it has no ground, it's not based on the knowledge of who God is, and because of that, that's a really dangerous trap. George Whitefield said, if we once get above our Bibles, and stop making the written Word of God our sole rule, both as to faith and practice, we shall soon lie open to all manner of delusion and be in danger of making shipwreck of faith and good conscience. What he's saying is sometimes when we really, you know what I'm saying, when, when we don't get in the Bible, it's almost like we're saying we, we know more. And if we think we know more than the Bible, man, we open ourselves up to delusion. When, when we just won't open our Bible, when we won't actually seek out what God says about us or about Himself in His Word, and we'll just believe or listen to anything, man, you open yourself up to so much delusion, and that's a dangerous thing. Jesus said, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, I cast out demons in your name, God. And he'll say, I never knew you. Get out of here. You're bound to hell forever. That should be the scariest thing ever said in Scripture, as far as I can find. Is that, I mean, somebody actually, like, cast, I've never cast out a demon. I would, you know, most of us, if we cast out a demon, I'd be like, obviously a Christian, because, like, who's not a Christian that does that? But here are some people that <laughs> cast out demons in his name, and, and God says, get out. I never knew you. You never knew me. You had this zeal for me, but it wasn't based on knowledge. You had this passion for God, but you knew nothing of Him. One of the most it, No, it is the most dangerous place to be in your Christian walk, is to believe in God but not to know anything of Him because you will open yourself up to delusion. You'll op open yourself up to false belief. You'll believe anything you hear because it sounds good enough. Because it sounds just like something Jesus would say. Do you hear what I'm saying? <clears throat> if anything, I want our youth group, I want our young people in this congregation to know God's Word and to be able to stand against the attacks of the enemy when someone comes up to you and says, well, you know what? This is right. Homosexuality is right. I'm going to give you my argument. And you know, some of us, I honestly believe in this room, might concede to that argument. Well, gosh, what can I say to that? Because 
we don't know enough of God's word. Some will say, God loves everybody, and if a loving God won't send people to hell, so I mean, everybody's going to heaven, right? But most of us in this room couldn't argue our way out, argue our way out of that. Most of us couldn't stand up for the truth in that moment. We have to take a stand for truth. We have to understand that there is a fine line that God has laid down in His Word, and if it doesn't say it in His Word, we we better better not do it. Better not chase after it. Yes, I saw uh, the video I saw on Twitter, and I'll tell you who it was. I'll tell you the minister it was Stephen Furtick. I don't know if you know that name. He's uh, we sang some songs from his church tonight, uh, but he, there was a thing he got on there, and he said, "You must be important because the size. If you got a big storm in your life, man, you must be something important because the devil is just attacking you, and so you got to be important because he's just trying to get you down." Boy, oh boy, oh boy! Never in the world in Scripture does it say that every storm in your life is the devil. So I don't know how. In the world, you could say that you, Bashir, you're something important because guess what? Your dog got ran over yesterday, and and you know your best friend killed himself, and and you just you're dealing with depression, so enemy's just attacking you because you're something special. All that leads people to think is get a big head about themselves, and won't we if we believe that kind of nonsense? Let me tell you, there's some Christians out there that have some pretty big storms in their life. And those storms lead them to God, not away. You know what I'm saying? It's time we stop opening ourselves up to delusion. And the only way that happens is you have to decide for yourself to hear what God says. You have to decide for yourself to know God's Word, to hear His voice, to know His promises, to trust His Spirit, to know who He is. Eternal life is knowing God. Check John 17.3. To know God's eternal life. And so many of us are passionate for God, but we don't know Him. And guess what? That's not eternal. Zeal for God's not eternal life. Zeal for God isn't salvation. Being passionate about God does not mean salvation. Knowing God is salvation. Not knowing about Him. Not knowing, oh, God's a great guy. He loves people. No, it's knowing Him personally. Being bound to Him personally. To know, you know, like in a, in a relationship, you know that person deeply, right? marriage relationship, dating relationship, you know that person deeply. We've got to have a relationship like that with the Lord where we know Him deeply and intimately. We know His voice. Listen, if you're dating somebody and you don't know what their voice sounds like, you're a bum. And you probably aren't dating anybody at all. Okay? All these Minecraft girlfriends and stuff, you see these TikToks and stuff where somebody calls their Minecraft girlfriend and it turns out to be the boy that's bullying them at school. Listen, if you don't know what your girlfriend or boyfriend sounds like, you are dumb. And shouldn't we be, oh, if that's the truth, shouldn't we be just as dumb to not know God's voice if we claim we love Him? Huh? Aren't we pretty dumb? Aren't we pretty stupid if we think, man... I love God, but we don't know what His voice sounds like. Jesus said, the sheep know my voice. Are you, a, are, are you a child of God? Are you one of His sheep of the shepherd? I mean, we are really dumb if we think, man, I love God, but we don't know what He sounds like. And that's why we believe any other voice that comes our way. Right? It's time we learned what God sounded like. His voice, His word. It's time that when we heard somebody speak, we could stand right then and say, that is not of God, even though it sounds real close to it. Maybe even there's some truth mixed into that, but that is not of God. Every one of us in this room needs to know, needs to know when something's of God and when something's not. And it's not, I mean, it's not an overnight process. It's not like you open your Bible tonight and all of a sudden this like aura of the Spirit comes down and like tomorrow you're watching this YouTube video and you're like, oh shoot, man, we better stop watching this because this dude said something that's not right. <laughs> it's not, it takes time and it takes, I mean, it takes time to know a person, right? You ever been in a dating relationship and you are trying to get to know that person? And you don't just know them in a day. Just like I said earlier, you're trying to get this uh, church camp boyfriend or girlfriend or something, and you don't know a thing about them. They could be anybody. It takes some time to find out who they are. It takes some time to find out who God is and to know His voice undoubtedly and to know what He says in His Word undoubtedly. It takes time and effort. But man, it's one of the most rewarding things because then you won't fall into the delusion of believing anything that comes your way. Yeah. How many of you want to believe the truth? 
I mean, I want, to, I want to know the truth. We live in a world that is plagued by false truths. We don't even know what's true anymore in this world, right? You had somebody, you know, threaten a school in Kentucky today, or any school in Kentucky. We don't know what school it was going to be. Nothing ever happened. Were we to know if that was true or not yesterday? We live in a world where we know, we do not know in this society what's true and what's not. The media can change anything they want. They've got technology. Now they can put a green screen up and you can be anywhere in the world and everybody would believe it because it's on the news or whatever. I'm not speaking out against all those things. I'm just saying we live in a world where it's hard to know the truth. If anybody should know the truth, it should be the Christian. If anybody should be able to look at something and say, that's not a God. If anybody should be able to look at something and say, that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not what God's Word said. That's not His voice. That's not God moving. It should be us. And I believe God wants to use this youth group to be a beacon of light and truth in this community. To stand up against the false teachings that come against your own personal life, but against others to draw them away from the faith. I believe God gave me this word because He wants you to understand how important it is to know what He says, who He is, how He works. Because really, I, you know, I don't see any point in going and telling somebody about Jesus if we don't know why we believe that. And if we really don't understand fully who God is, it's called the mystery of godliness. The mystery, there's so many mysteries. God likes mysteries. You know, in the Bible, it's mystery, mystery, mystery. And yet, God has revealed many things to us. And what He's revealed in this word, you can know and you can understand you can stand against the lies that come against your own heart. Just like these lies, like temptation, man, that's a lie too. You want to stand against temptation? Know what God's Word says. Jesus, when the devil tempted Jesus and tried to get him to sin, what did Jesus fall back on every time? The Word of God. He says, make these stones into bread. And Jesus says, man does not live on bread alone. The Bible says that. He says, jump off this building, the angels will catch you. He said, it also says, don't test the Lord your God. Satan says, man, I'll give you all these kings of the world if you just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, the word says, God's word says, you know, God said himself that the only person that should be worshipped is him. Man, when temptation comes your way, what can you fall back on? You can fall back on the word, but not if you don't know it. Not if you don't know what God said. You can't fall back on God's voice if you haven't heard it. You can't fall back on God's word if you haven't known it. So when you want to face temptation in this life, when you want to face opposition, when you want to face false truth, when you want to be able to know the truth and not fall into some delusion and end up in hell because you chose to believe something that sounded so much like the gospel but it wasn't, you better know who God is. You better know God's word. You better be in time and in prayer with Him because I'm telling you, we are in a world today where there's so much false teaching. I think more people know false teaching than they do the real teaching of the gospel. Maybe most of our, I'd say, I dare say that there's probably more pastors and youth pastors out there that, that believe a false gospel than believe the real one. And because of that, they're spitting out false disciples of Christ. Do you hear what I'm saying? Don't forget, Satan does not fight the church. He joins it. Because he wants to look like you and me. He wants to look just like God. Because that's what will get you into hell with you. If you would just bow your heads with me tonight. God, I just want to thank you for every person in this room.